Well, hello, plant lovers. It is Matthew in Melbourne. Thank you very much for finding me in the crowded world of orchid YouTube videos. If you're new here, I try to grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia without a greenhouse or grow lights or humidifiers or equipment, really just me and them struggling to find our way inside or outside or not at all. Many failures along the way, plant lovers, but if any of this might help you, then do hit subscribe. I post every week on a Friday. And today, a triumph video because I have finally got an orchid to bloom for the first time and I think we should talk about it. Yes, it's this humble little beast right here. Look at that gorgeous little spray of a flower and without any more waffling, here is the name Dendrobium ringeniense. Now, quite a story. Is the Yes, there is. Anyway, now firstly, it's in a secondary pot because the small pot will wobble over if it's on its own. It's actually suspended outside. So that's why it's in this other pot, because if it fell over and I snapped those flowers off today, I would be deeply upset. So Dendrobium ringeniense. Let's have a little look. Now, first cab off the rank is the name Rind Yaniense. As you can see, there is a D in there, plant lovers, on the label. And the plant is registered as thus with a D. But in fact, it was named in 1925 after, and I presume, the mountain that it was found on, which is actually Mount Rinjani. Uh, R-I-N-J-A-N-I. -I. So someone slipped in a cheeky D. Now here's the other thing about oh, nomenclature. If someone makes a spelling mistake when they're naming a plant, which is quite common, particularly if it's named after a place or a person, Budlia is a great example of this. So Budlia was named after the Reverend Alfred Buddle, B-U-D-D-L-E, and whoever was then naming the plant after him slipped in a J which shouldn't have been there and it has to remain ever since. A little bit like the D, I think, in our friend here. Then once that name is registered, that's it. You can never correct the spelling. So if that is indeed incorrect because the mountain it was named after doesn't have the D in the name, then it can't ever be changed. It is immortalized with the bad spelling. So Woe be it were I to ever name anything, because I am literally the worst speller in the world, so I would be responsible for all manner of nomenclature nightmares. But anyway, now that mountain is in Lombok, which is an island right next to Bali, which is perhaps more famous in the Indonesian archipelago. And I will show you here where it is. As you can see, there is not much separating Bali and Lombok, but it's so interesting because that line between Bali and Lombok is where the Wallace line stretches. And the Wallace line is a fascinating creation of Alfred Wallace, who was a 19th century botanist, scientist, geologist, and a contemporary of Darwin. But he actually was writing about evolution of the species before Darwin, but Darwin probably just had a better PR person uh, and he got the idea out first. But Wallace realized that there was a line in Asia which separated complex mammals and older, less complex mammals. So on one side of the line you have simians, you know, great apes and deer and complex beasts like that. And on the other side, much older, simpler beasts, which is really the Australasian fauna like kangaroos and marsupials. Anyway, that's those two land masses met at Lombok. So on one side, you've got monkeys and all sorts of things, and on the other side, you don't. Anyway, does that have any relevance? Not really, but it's just a very interesting place botanically and fauna-wise. Of course, plants were able to drift across islands much more readily than their bigger mammalian friends. And this plant was found on that island of Lombok, but it's actually found on a few other islands across that Indonesian archipelago, but it's named after that mountain. And if you Google it, which should be your homework, it is one of those incredible volcanoes that erupted in ancient history and then collapsed back on itself. So there's a lake and there's the ring of the old, is it the caldera? Hmm, you know, the, the shell of the old volcano. And then in the middle of that lake, the new volcano is starting to emerge. So quite a volatile, active place and very fertile too, because the soil will be incredible with all that volcanic ash. Anyway, that is where this baby comes from. Now, plant lovers, that is quite different to Melbourne. I'm here to tell you that. Although today it's autumn and it's a really beautiful day. It's overcast, it's drizzling, but the minimum is 17 degrees centigrade. 
which is 62-ish Fahrenheit, and the maximum's only gonna be a few degrees warmer. So oh, it's just kind of blizzing. It's perfect uh, autumn orchid weather. You know, it's gonna get colder, and I'm just not ready for that. But anyway, so this orchid grows in what is essentially a very tropical environment, but it's a higher altitude plant, and it is managing to grow quite successfully in my environment. Now I'm gonna take you outside now and just show you where it is. So I've kind of got it in a metal hook, and it's on the side of another plant and it gets bright indirect-ish light. That part of the sort of outdoor area is east facing. So as the sun passes over, it does get quite reasonable shade for most of the afternoon. And particularly in winter, it's a little murkier in that part of my growing space. But the thing is, I only just moved this plant there about four months ago. So I moved it in summer. Why, I hear you cry. Well, I bought this plant probably four years ago, the beginning of my mad orchid career, and I had no idea, so I just bought it. And it came from a place, because the tag's still here, uh, called Orchid Species Plus, and I'll put their link below. Guess what they specialize in? Yes, species orchids. And I've never really ever seen it for sale since, so I think I was quite lucky. Also lucky I didn't kill it because I didn't know anything about growing orchids, least of all this one. And I just Googled it and it looked like it was a shade lover. So I just put it in quite a uh, almost deep shade spot and it grew, but it never thrived. Now it's probably, if we look at the top, can you see there are these old um, deciduous canes, leafless canes. So that's sort of about the size of the plant when I got it. So not flowering size by any stretch of the imagination. So it would have taken a few years to grow uh, to flowering size. So maybe anyway it would have bloomed this year, but I just realized it probably wasn't getting enough light. And when you, when you read about the care and conditions of orchids, it's sort of important to interpret them like a painting because it's not literal. So if you look at Google images of that mountain and have a look at it. It's quite interesting, the vegetation, lots of pine as it gets taller as well. So if you imagine the light in that area, it is not consistent and it will change as the sun moves. And if it's in an evergreen forest condition, then it's going to get pretty consistent dappled light. Or if it's in a forest that's deciduous, it's gonna get much more light in winter. Or if it's in a mix, a mix. So you have gotta kinda of nut it out. So when something says, you know, deep shade or reasonable shade or shade. You gotta try and figure that out. So what it might need is morning sun. Anyway, that's a ramble. The fact is it has responded so much better to that bright indirect light. You can see these wonderful growths. The new canes are longer and healthier and I'm not doing anything different in terms of watering and feeding. It's quite simply the light. And then this is I guess the oldest cane, so this is a newer one and these two are new. This would be the second oldest and this is the oldest cane and it's flowered. Now I think definitely it is the light. So moral of the story is you've really got to figure out the light conditions and generally something doesn't flower because it's not getting enough light. And even though some things are shade lovers, they still need light, so maybe that's just more bright morning light and then dappled light. You've got to figure it out, and it's quite hard. You've just got to figure out what works best for you, I suppose. Anyway, I think I've got the sweet spot for this. Well, I have, because look, it's flowered. So I am really happy with that. So I think we've done the name. So often things are named after the place they were first found or the person that found it or some weird botanical trait of the plant, you know, like it's got a vein on some tiny part of the flower or it's got a furry seed capsule or whatever it might be. Uh, and then dendrobium, of course, we are all familiar with from the Greek dendron and bios, meaning tree and life. Ergo, the plant lives on the tree and the tree gives it life, although it doesn't because it's not a parasite. It's living on the tree, not sort of in it. Anyway, dendrobium. And like, I think 75% of the world's orchids, it's an epiphyte which means it lives on something else, of course, dendro, tree, so it lives on trees. And some epiphytes are real clingers, they cling to the side like an alien. Others are sort of more nestlers, they can nestle in nooks of material that's built up in uh, forks of the branches or other parts of the tree where sort of material has collected in particularly barky trees where moss and bits of leaf has, has collected. The epiphytes can live in that sort of special area. This one I think is a 
bit more of a clinger, which means, of course, it's going to want plenty of air movement, not only around the plant, but the roots, and a pretty free draining mix, because you imagine it's clinging to the side of a tree when it rains, the, the moisture rushes past, the plant absorbs what it wants. It can also absorb a little bit more from the surface of the tree, which would have absorbed water, but then it will dry out and then it will happen again. So that kind of almost drying before it gets watered regime is a good one to try and replicate. And then drobiums are found, well, they're sort of Asiatic Pacific. So um, India, Bhutan, Nepal, then all the way through Southeast Asia, China, Japan, all the way down across um, Indonesia, New Guinea, Australia, and all the way across to New Zealand, you find dendrobiums. Very, very different types of plant too. You can imagine there's a vast array of conditions. So you've got altitude mountain, you've got really full on tropical heat, and then you've got monsoonal areas, and then you've got arid areas in Australia where dendrobiums grow very well. Um, and then sort of southern cooler parts of Australia where dendrobiums are native and do very well as well. So a really broad genus, hence lots of different growing conditions. Anyway, this one though is a species, which means it's as it's found in the wild. And it's quite pretty. I mean, it's not a massive flower and it's not flashy. And a lot of dendrobiums uh, have been hybridized to produce bigger flowers and more fragrance and more proliferousness. Um, this one though, quite a humble little beast. I love it and haven't actually ever smelt it. No, not a hint of fragrance, but just look at those very, very pretty flowers. So they're essentially um, a lilac color, which then fades to a white tip. Very, very pretty. And then inside, there's just like a splodge of deeper magenta. Very, very pretty. And as you can imagine, when more canes are in bloom, it will be a sight to behold. Now it flowers in autumn and guess what? It's autumn, so it's doing the right thing at the right time. The flower buds have come from the very end of the cane, which makes me wonder, but I'm gonna compare and contrast to this little baby here. So we might get to that in a minute. But anyway, it's flowered from the end of the cane. But what you can also see about the canes is they have this really sort of interesting um, sort of bobble form. So they're quite bulbous at each juncture and a slight mauve tinge to them. Now mine's always had that, so you can see even the newer canes have got that sort of mauve tinge. Quite beautiful, but really quite an unusual form to the cane itself. Temperature-wise then, it's kind of interesting. So that island is in the tropics and you know, Bali and Lombok are great tropical destinations. Obviously the higher you get, the cooler it gets and the cooler the nighttime minimums will be, particularly in winter. But I'm not quite sure how far up the mountain this might grow or how far down it might grow. And I guess this brings us to the next point, which is how far can you go? You know, there's that thing called zonal denial. We don't have the same climatic uh, horticultural zones in Australia as you do in the States. But you know, you know things that you can and should grow and things that you wanna grow and perhaps couldn't and things that really stretch the boundaries of what's realistic. I think with orchids too, it's really hard to find information. So a great way is to join a local club and find out who's growing what in your area and in what conditions. For me, that has been really useful, um, particularly meeting growers and just asking them about things and going to the sale days, of course, which is fabulous, because you get to see the plant, but also to talk to the person who's grown it and find out, do they have extra shade? Do they have extra heating? Do they have extra ventilation? Do they bring them indoors? Is it a heated greenhouse? Blah, blah, blah. So it's great to find out how someone grows something, but then sometimes you just gotta take a punt because I'd never heard of this before. I bought it when I knew nothing and it thrived. Some orchids are a lot cooler tolerant than you might think. Miltonia is a great example of that. They live outside all year for me, undercover, so protected from winter rain, but they get cold, mm, cool winter nighttime minimums. We never really get to freezing here in inner city Melbourne, but pretty close. This one too, you wouldn't necessarily think would be able to go down to such low temperatures, but it thrives, absolutely thrives. So I guess within reason and without taking undue risks, you can sort of experiment a bit to find out what can work for you in the conditions that you've got. And as I say in my spiel at the beginning, I just grow orchids inside or outside. So they've got to manage with that climate. I am not gonna do anything else. I'm not gonna do humidifiers or um, heating or adapt to the outside space at all. They've just gotta sink or swim. 
So growth-wise, pretty standard. You've got these long canes. The older canes become deciduous, and then you have newer canes growing from the crown of the plant. I've also got a little nib here, uh, which might well probably be a new growth, and we'll compare and contrast to this one in a second. And then the more mature the plant gets, the bigger the canes get. It's not a massively long um, dendrobium, so you see those pictures of those incredible Himalayan orchids that are sort of a meter long, or you know, two and a half, three feet, covered in blooms. This is not gonna be one of those. I think it's a more contained plant, a lot like me. So just a bit more subtle, and I think that's probably, you know, as big as it probably will get. Now, potting-wise, this is a rather odd terracotta pot, again, bought in the early days of my career. But terracotta has many advantages. It evaporates really quickly and can keep the roots cool. And that evaporation means that the roots don't stay wet. It does mean it dries out really quickly in warm weather, in summer. So you do have to keep your eye on watering in warmer weather. And then winter, uh, not to water too much because the terracotta can absorb the water and it dries out slower in cooler weather, but nonetheless it still dries out. And I just like the look and feel of terracotta rather than plastic. And this is just in a medium-ish sized bark mix with a little bit of perlite and a little bit of sphagnum. But this has been potted in this pot for four years, plant lovers, and it's suddenly taken off. So if it ain't broke, I'm not gonna repot it. So we've looked at the light outside, bright and direct. Uh, we've covered the temperature. I think it could certainly grow warmer, perhaps. Um, but again, I don't know because I don't grow it warmer. Watering wise, it's not one that I allow to dry out completely in winter. So you know a lot of dendrobiums want to be really, really dry in winter, not this one. So I do water it, but I do allow it to dry out a bit more in between waterings in winter. So I don't keep it soggy, but in summer I water it a lot. And often out there it gets quite hot, so literally I can water every day, but it evaporates and dries out really quickly. Food-wise, I give it a topical treatment of slow release general fertilizer in spring, and that releases over six months. And then during the warmer periods, I will give it a liquid feed, maybe once every week-ish, if I can remember and get myself together. <laughs> And that will either take the form of a tonic, which is not a fertilizer, but it's literally a tonic. And for me, that can be a product called sea salt, which is a seaweed-based solution, not sea salt, as someone once said, no. Sea salt, as in soluble seaweed. Uh, a great tonic for plants. Great too if you've just repotted something or you've just received something in the mail. Great to just give it um, a diluted watering with that. It just helps settle the plant in. Or I give it a liquid fertilizer, which can be anything, a generic, general fertilizer for flowering plants or an orchid specific liquid fertilizer and I really mix it up so that uh, the plants getting different things throughout the year. Whatever it is though I always dial down the dilution much more than it says to sort of one eighth one tenth of the recommendation just to not overdo the feeding. Okay well you may have noticed that next to it we've got a friend and this friend is Dendrobium Victoria Regine. Now, as you can see, it's still in bloom, and I often feature this dendrobium because it's always in bloom. This one won't be. This one is definitely a one season only flower. This one, however, is much more opportunistic. And in fact, what I've just noticed is there are buds at the end of that growth and buds at the end of that growth. So I think by the time these flowers drop off, I'll have another two clusters, um, which is great. Because I never like my Dendrobium Victoria Regine to be naked. Um, and I'm just looking at these old canes. Anyway, so the older canes, even though they drop their leaves, can still bloom, so don't trim them. Now, the thing I wanted to show you was, though, just in terms of growth habit. So this is a new cane for me, and it's flowering for the first time. And as you can see, it is flowering from the very tip of the cane. So it seems to share a trait that it's flowering from the tip. Now, Dendrobium Victoria Regine will then flower from subsequent nodes up the stem over time. It will never flower from the same spot again. But if you look at this old shriveled cane here, can you see those little sort of beige nibs at each leaf joint? Well, that's where it's flowered before. So at least sort of four or five different bloom, blooming periods have occurred from the tip and then up the cane. So on a cane, you can get many cycles of flowering. And I'm just wondering with our friend Dendrobium ringeniense, whether the same thing will happen, whether once blooming has triggered on the mature cane from the tip, 
then in the subsequent flowering time, which will be next autumn, I might then get other blooms from the other joints further up the cane. And as the other canes mature, you'll get the same process there. So perhaps hopefully I will end up in a position like this one, where you do get multiple blooms only at one time of year for this one. But on this one, sometimes I've had three or four canes flowering at the same time, and it's a sight to behold. So I'd love the same thing to happen for that one. Anyway, so there we go. The other thing is Dendrobium Victoria Regine is um, demonstrating the same trait. So you have a new cane that grows from sort of the crown of the plant, whoosh, but then it will also branch and it's not a cakey, it's a branch. So you can see there's this um, new growth here, this new growth here, and then here we have got one growing there. So a cakey would produce roots and is a viable sort of new plant really. This one has never produced roots and it's quite old. And I would say it actually is starting to get to flowering size. So interesting growth habit. And what I've noticed on our friend Ringeniense, with no D, <laughs> is that I have got a little growth coming out of the top of this cane. So who knows, that could be a cakey or it could have the same growth habit as I've decided its cousin, Dendrobium victoria regine. Well, there we are, plant lovers. I think we've covered everything with this little beauty. I'm so thrilled it's bloomed. It's always so exciting when something new blooms for the first time for you and you've proves that you've actually got it right. So Dendrobium ringeniense, I'm very pleased with you. Our Dendrobium ringeniense epic has come to an end. I am really, really excited it's flowered for me. It is an orchid species and I belong to the Orchid Species Society of Victoria, which I'll link below, which is a very useful group to meet experts and to learn how to grow things and also to get invited to their sale dates, which is absolutely amazing. But so saying, never seen this there. I'm excited it's flowered, excited I haven't killed it, excited to see what could come of it, and I'm excited by what I might be doing next week. Who knows what it is, but if you want to know, hit subscribe, I post every week on a Friday. I am an amateur rambling away, making many mistakes, some of which I decide to share and some are just too shameful. But anyway, plant lovers, I look very much forward to seeing you next week, wherever you are, take care, and I will see you next Friday.